So first, again, thank you for being here. Absolutely. So let's start with poverty. Uh, scholars have estimated or found that the number of American families living in extreme poverty, under $2 a day in cash income, has skyrocketed in the last 20 years. You have about 1.5 million families and 3 million children. Given how many children are now in that condition, should we be following the model of countries like Sweden and Germany and now Canada under Trudeau that have a universal child allowance to cut or eliminate child poverty? Well, this is a very personal and important issue to me because, as you know, I started out my uh, work as a lawyer for the Children's Defense Fund, and I have been focused on child poverty and what we can do to alleviate it uh, for a very long time. Uh, I would just slightly amend your question because we were making progress in the 90s. We had more people lifted out of poverty. We had a 33% increase uh, in the uh, African-American family income. We were on the right track. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't have been looking at more ways to lift more kids out of poverty, but we were on the right trajectory. And unfortunately, we changed direction. And we had policies that I think contributed greatly to the uh, increase in childhood poverty starting in 2001. The Great Recession being the worst of those, but there were also uh, policy decisions, regulatory changes, uh, providing more leeway to the states so that uh, they did not have uh, the either requirement or the incentive to continue lifting people, uh, particularly kids, out of poverty. So we've got a big problem, and it's a problem that is a reflection on our political as well as our economic uh, systems. And I do think we should focus on how we're going to try to uh, support more families. And there are a number of inputs, but trying to create more financial support is something that we should look at. I'm not ready to adopt a plan that comes from some other country because we have to look to see how we would do anything in our federal system and how it would be uh, workable and what the uh, cost uh, benefit uh, analysis might be. But while we're looking at how we lift incomes, which is the defining economic challenge that we have for middle class, working, and poor families, we need to do much more to provide the proven interventions in uh, early childhood education that help families, even poor families, know more about how to better prepare their kids. We need to do more with nutrition, and we are making progress with health care thanks to uh, S-CHIP and the Affordable Care Act. So it's not just a uh, decision about whether or not to increase the child tax credit or some other means of providing a greater financial safety net. It's also what we can do to really support families. And I, I think we have to move on both tracks. But to ask a big picture question about that <clears throat> policy shift, something that a lot of poverty scholars argue to me is that we made a very big change towards trying to support the working poor. Welfare reform was, of course, part of that. It went from, in the numbers I've seen, bringing about a million of these families out of this kind of poverty to around 300,000 in more recent years. But the expansions of the EITC, other things we've seen. Right. Do you think we do too little now to support the poor who, for whatever reason, cannot find or cannot keep a job? I do. And I know there's a big debate, and it's a, an important debate about welfare reform, because when uh, welfare reform was passed, there was uh, an expectation, certainly on my part, and I think on the part of many who had supported it, uh, that there would be uh, an expectation, in fact, uh, a requirement that states would have to uh, be contributing to the broadest possible safety net, particularly in economic downturns, so that we wouldn't help the working poor, particularly through the EITC, which I think is one of the best anti-poverty programs that we have uh, devised, we would not be doing it at the expense of the poor. We would also be uh, providing a continuing safety net for the poor. And that's one of the uh, programs that I was referring to when I said uh, after 2001, there were a lot of decisions made that basically did not carry on what had been not just the spirit, but the uh, requirements in the law because we had set the uh, the base payment at the highest possible rate and expected states to do that. So 
We are back to a serious problem of poverty, and I think we have to do much more to target federal programs to the poorest, where intergenerational poverty is once again uh, a cycle. Uh, Congressman Jim Clyburn has a creative idea called the 10-20-30 approach, where you would put a percentage of federal funds, 10% of federal funds, in those communities that are you know, most impoverished and have been for 30 years. So I think we've got to uh, address uh, really uh, systemic generational poverty differently. We still have to lift up working people. We have to make it worth everybody's while to work. We have to create more good jobs. We have to have the, you know, the training pipeline there. Uh, but we are now, unfortunately, back uh, having to face uh, poverty that we thought we had uh, uh, a better uh, approach toward ending than it turns out, given the change in administrations and attitudes, uh, we did. Let me ask you a bit about how to pay for that. So I looked at the <clears throat> Treasury's Real Daily Yield Curve website today, as I do every day when I get out of bed in the morning. <laughs> and short-term interest rates on U.S. government debt are real interest rates, are negative now. Right. They will pay us to take money. That is how much the market wants more U.S. government debt. Right. Should we be taking the markets up on this offer of free money? Should we be doing more short-term deficit spending for infrastructure, for poverty, for middle-class tax cuts, and worrying less in the near term about deficits? Well, I think we have missed an opportunity over the last um, eight years to make some uh, big bets on America, to make some investments with, as you say, money that is as low in terms of interest rates as it's ever going to be. Uh, I have put forth ways of paying for all the investments that I make because we do have the entitlement issues out there that we can't ignore, but we are failing to make investments that will make us richer and stronger uh, in the future. And that's where I think our biggest gap is. So I think it's important that we look for ways to pay for our investments, but I think that there can be short-term decisions about the kind of uh, you know, federal dollars that are available now with a revenue stream to pay them back in the future that would bridge the gap if we can't do everything that we need to do to really give the uh, economy and job creation the kind of boost that it uh, uh, it needs. But I I'm not going to commit myself to that because I would like first to pay for what we go we're going to do because I think that we've had a, a period where the gains have gone to the wealthy. You know, the Great Recession wiped out $13 trillion in family wealth. And a lot of people have come back roaring. They are doing better than ever. Corporate profits are up, whereas so many Americans are stalled or have fallen backwards. Real family income hasn't moved. In fact, it's below where it was in 19, you know, 99 and 2000. So we do have a problem. It's a real problem because we are a 70% consumption economy, so we've got to get more growth going. And the best way to do that is to invest in these jobs, and I think we can pay for what we need to do through uh, uh, raising taxes on the wealthy and you know, making it clear that there's got to be a commitment to these investments if we're going to grow the economy, which will benefit everybody. So that's interesting. I've, I've not heard you say it that way before. So part of the argument for doing pay-fors in the near term is not just balancing the budget or reducing the deficit, but also bringing a distributional fairness to the aftermath That's of the right. recession. You know, last, uh, last summer I gave two economic speeches uh, which called for strong growth, fair growth, and long-term growth. Uh, and I think the three go together. And it is important that we look at how they can converge uh, because I, I do believe that we've got to grow the economy. I'm a uh, an economic growth uh, uh, Democrat, so I believe that. But we also have to make it fairer, and part of the way we make it fair is by shifting some of the tax burden onto those who have done really well, despite all of the macro and micro economic ups and downs in uh, the global economy and here at home. And that's why the Buffett rule. That's why a uh, a, a fair uh, share surcharge on incomes above five million. That's why closing the loopholes like the carried interest loophole. It's not just a symbolic 
uh, effort to say, hey, you know, we, we, we got to get rid of the gimmicks and the games. It's also to get money to do what we need to do to lift the bottom and the middle up. And it is a way of making clear that growth and fairness have to go together. I think it's probably an understatement at this point to say that immigration has been a big part of this year's campaign. Mm -hmm. And there, we talk a lot about the folks who are already here, um, the roughly 11 million unauthorized immigrants already here. And I know you're supportive of comprehensive immigration reform. Mm -hmm. But in the broader question around immigration and, and the economy, the economic data I've seen suggests pretty straightforwardly that immigrants are good for the U.S. economy, and particularly they are as the mm -hmm. population ages. Mm -hmm. So do you think it would be good for the economy to double or triple the number of people who could come here legally? I think we have to deal with first things first. I think that uh, it, it is certainly uh, the case that immigration has been and continues to be good for our economy. Immigrants start businesses at a faster rate. Uh, they seem to grow those businesses uh, more successfully. Uh, they do fill certain gaps in skills and knowledge that uh, are good for the overall economy. <coughs> but I think there are three big problems that we have to address. One is just the human cost of those 11 million undocumented uh, immigrants. I have met many, many of them. In fact, we all have, whether we acknowledge it or not. And these are hardworking people. These are people who are contributing already to the economy, whose children are in schools, who are really absolutely committed to the American dream. Uh, the little girl I met in Las Vegas who is living in fear that her parents were going to be deported with stomach aches and all kinds of physical ailments. Uh, you know, she should be a kid and she, she should be enjoying school and, and learning and deciding what she's going to do. So I do think we have to be very understanding and uh, accepting of the, you know, the human stories that are behind these statistics that people like Donald Trump throw around. I think also, though, there's a lot of evidence that moving toward comprehensive immigration reform with a path to citizenship would be good for our economy. We already know that undocumented workers are putting about $12 billion into the Social Security Trust Fund with no uh, anticipation at this point that they'll ever get anything out. They're paying payroll taxes. They're paying uh, other forms of taxes, state and local as well as federal. So we do have a productive part of our economy. And most of the analysts that I have seen suggest that this idea of deporting everybody would be a severe blow to the economy and it would cost you know, millions of jobs and it would depress economic growth. So there's a moral, humanitarian, kind of American values argument and there's an economic argument. I think it would be very difficult to do anything on immigration until we make the uh, decision that there will be comprehensive immigration reform because otherwise, we are mixing up uh, a lot of the uh, concerns about immigration in a way that will, I think, hurt both uh, the uh, side of immigration about people who fill jobs we, we need, particularly high value jobs, and the people who are here living in fear because somebody's going to come around, round them up and deport them. So I think we have to look at all these issues. I mean, the idea of a comprehensive immigration reform with a path to citizenship that I would envision is one that would deal with a lot of these concerns, not just the 11 million people here, how we would regularize them, what kind of steps they would have to go through, because I believe they do have to um, meet certain standards if they're going to be on a path to citizenship. But I don't want to mix that with, you know, other kinds of changes in visas and other uh, concerns that uh, particularly high value technical uh, companies have. In fact, I think keeping the pressure on them helps us resolve the bigger problem. And then we can look to see what else, if anything, uh, can and should be done. But I would also add one of the biggest uh, complaints that I hear around the country is how um, callous and insensitive American corporations have become to American workers who have skills that are ones that should make them employable. The many stories of people training their replacements from some foreign country are heartbreaking. And 
It is obviously a cost-cutting measure to be able to pay people less than what you would pay an American worker. I think it's also a, um, a very uh, unfair and sad commentary that, you know, we don't want to invest in training American workers because, you know, that's just time consuming and it, it's a cost. Uh, so even if they could do what we're wanting them to do, it's just easier to get somebody who will be largely um, compliant because they want to stay in the country. And, you know, that's just wrong. So there's work we have to do on all sides of the immigration uh, debate. And I want to see companies have to do more to employ uh, already uh, uh, qualified Americans. Why do you think it is that it is so intuitive to people or so intuitive to many people that there is a zero sum competition with immigrants for jobs? As you said, that's not often what the economic evidence shows, but it, it's powering a lot yeah. of politics in this country. I think it's because everybody with six degrees of separation either knows or thinks they know somebody who knows somebody who lost a job to an undocumented worker or to a worker brought over on a visa to do their job. There's just a lot of churn that suggests this is a real problem. Now, the argument that I have been making is, look, part of the reason why Americans are agitated about immigration is because they do believe their jobs are being taken out from under them. And there is an unlevel playing field because if you are employing undocumented workers and nobody is holding you accountable, which we haven't, we haven't enforced those laws in a very comprehensive way, um, then it's easy to undercut the market and to, you know, say, hey, roofer, come down. I'm substituting this man for you. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Here's your last paycheck. Because the man that they're putting up there is going to cost, you know, maybe as little as a tenth of the of the uh, price of the guy who was on the roof. And so I think it's real. It is not, you know, it's hard to argue at an economic analytics uh, abstraction that, you know, really it's not that much job displacement and, you know, the overall economy is better and they're making these investments in social security trust fund. It's really hard when you're the one who's lost the job. When you are at Disney in Orlando and you're told to retrain your successors and then kicked out the door, or when you're on a construction site and all of a sudden, you know, you show up the next morning and they tell you that, they don't need you anymore because they've picked up a bunch of folks uh, at a job corner in the in the neighborhood. So there is enough real world experience that gives people uh, the anxiety that we're seeing in the political uh, environment. So is it a big job displacement? No. But is it something? Yes. Is it something that is painful and personally hurtful to people? Somebody you know, maybe not you, but someone down the line, absolutely. And I think it's a mistake to just make the, the economic argument. And I think it's important that we see the undocumented as people with real stories, with kids who are going to school, with people working 70, 80 hours a week to have a good life. And it's also important we see the other side of the story uh, with people who feel doubly hammered. They feel hammered by global competition, particularly from China, taking their jobs. And then they feel hammered from within by employers who are willing to uh, hire undocumented workers and never get held accountable for it. During the debates with Senator Sanders, you guys clashed on free college. And you made the argument that you did not want to be subsidizing the tuition of Donald Trump's children, and fair enough. But that argument could also be made on public elementary school, on public high school, on public libraries. So how do you think about when a policy should be universal in nature and when it should be more specifically targeted at the needy? I think about that um, uh, in the following way. We have always had a uh, mixed public-private higher education system. And although we do have private schools within elementary and secondary education, they have not been as big a factor as private higher education has been. And so what we're really talking about already is a hybrid system. 
because even Senator Sanders is not talking about uh, subsidizing private higher education. And I think that's a significant difference. So that the cost of higher education uh, has always been an individual family responsibility aided by uh, scholarships, grants, work-study programs, the whole uh, mix of uh, ways we enable people to go to college. But we don't pretend that we're going to do anything for those who choose a private college. Now, we let the GI Bill go to either public or private schools. We let Pell Grants go to public or private schools. So we do help to subsidize individuals at private uh, colleges or universities. But we have never uh, taken the position that there is no difference between the two of them. Just like we have a big fight, as you know, all the time at, in federal and state legislatures about will we subsidize private elementary and secondary education. And with very few exceptions, the answer has been no, you know, that we do believe in the importance of a public education system. So we have adopted these approaches. And I think the I, I had several concerns about Senator Sanders' program. Um, I thought that it was uh, hard to justify uh, claiming it was free when it was going to have to be paid for by state governments and by a lot of state governments uh, up to a third of the cost that were not particularly well known for supporting higher education. In fact, they'd been disinvesting. And I think it's more important that we incentivize reinvestment in higher, in public higher education. So rather than holding out the promise of free college, which wasn't really free, it was going to be paid for by state and federal dollars, um, I think it's important that we say, we're going to subsidize as far as we can responsibly go, but we are going to expect states to reinvest in higher education. and. You know, I, I know the arguments that have been made, and, and he was an eloquent advocate for the argument that it should be like Social Security. It never has been. That is not how we view it. And it would be incredibly expensive to do that, as he had proposed. And even he relied on states which have been disinvesting, and we need to reverse that. So they start investing. So I want to go as as high up the income scale as I can to make sure that middle class, working, and poor families don't have to borrow money to go to college. But I don't want to add the cost of subsidizing me or subsidizing Donald Trump at this point. I don't think that that is a sensible way for us to approach this. Let's talk about another interesting Fisher from the primary. Uh, you often said that your preference was that we built on Obamacare to get to true universal coverage. Um, and I've read your plan around Obamacare, and it doesn't do that yet. So what would be your approach for taking that program from the roughly 90% covered that it's at now to 100%? Well, let's celebrate that we're at 90% coverage. And I think that is one of the differences. Um, you know, I see the glass as 90% full, not empty, <laughs> and starting over again, either by repealing it as the Republicans advocate or by coming up with a whole new plan. So I think it's tremendous. And there was just a Robert Wood Johnson study that pointed out just in the now five years since it's been implemented, healthcare spending has gone down $2.6 trillion from the projection that it uh, originally uh, thought it would uh, increase by. So we are really making progress. And I think it is important to build on that progress. We have 20 million people who are now in the uh, affordable care system. We've expanded Medicaid, which I want to see expanded in every state that hasn't, uh, because I think that was an ideological um, rather than economic or a, a moral decision. And I want us to build on the Affordable Care Act. Now, how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to have to be clear about the competition that is needed to keep costs more uh, reasonable. It is uh, going to require us to take a hard look at premiums, co-pays, deductibles, and see what we can do to limit uh, the kind of additional costs, uh, particularly for prescription drugs, that uh, policyholders have under the exchanges. Uh, we have got to encourage more competition, not just by you know, working with the existing insurers, but really trying to open the door more successfully than was achieved 
uh, to other forms of insurance. You know, the cooperative insurance plan hasn't worked in most places, but it's worked in some places. What are the lessons we can learn from that? So I'm actually very excited about this. And I think we will get to uh, 100% coverage. And I think we will do it uh, by building on what people are now accepting by spending their own dollars and by our subsidies of those. And it is a much more uh, acceptable, less disruptive approach than starting over and trying to impose uh, a single payer system. Because remember, the vast majority of Americans are getting their health insurance through their employment. They There is very little evidence that they are unsatisfied by it. I certainly saw that firsthand when I was working on this back in 93 and 94. Uh, and I favor a public option so that we can try to lower the cost even further for people who have a, a larger risk of, uh, you know, bad uh, health uh, problems. Should that public option be able to link with Medicare to bargain down prices? I think it's going to be something we have to look at. And I have long been in favor of giving Medicare the uh, authority to bargain. And I have voted for it. I've spoken out for it. You mean on prescription drugs? On prescription drugs. And uh, if it were to be a broader public option, maybe there as well, because it is clear that we don't have enough bargaining power yet uh, to deal with some of the big cost drivers like prescription drugs uh, that are still uh, not um, reacting the way we would hope uh, that they would. In fact, there's a lot of new gimmicks to try to drive up the cost of prescription drugs. But I'm actually optimistic. I think that we're on the right track with the Affordable Care Act. And of course, we're going to have to make adjustments. We did with every other program that people now uh, uh, defend and, and love. And we're going to do it with the Affordable Care Act. So we've talked about a number of policies here, but not so much about how to get them done. Um, what are the qualities you think that you possess that are needed for an effective presidency that aren't rewarded or revealed by the campaign trail? Well, I think a lot of governing is, you know, the slow, hard boring of hard boards. I don't think there's anything sexy, exciting, or headline grabbing about it. I think it is getting up every day, building the relationships, finding whatever sliver of common ground you can occupy, never ever giving up in continuing to reach out even to people who are uh, sworn political partisan uh, adversaries. And I've seen it work. I've seen it work. And I've been part of seeing it and making it work. So I, I really believe there's no shortcut. There is no uh, quick answer. Now, if there's a major national disaster, uh, then uh, like the Great Recession, you can get things done that you couldn't otherwise. But And you have to seize those moments. And I think uh, President Obama did that. But I think you've got to try to push forward as many different issues as you can uh, all at the same time, because you never know what's going to turn uh, the tide. And so I I just think it's that getting up every day and working on it. And it it is not flashy. And you don't telegraph everything you're doing because that would be breaching the relationship and the negotiation that you may be involved in. Uh, I certainly saw my husband do it. And he did it with people who were trying to destroy him. Every single day, he'd meet with them at night and uh, they'd hammer out uh, you know, deals, they would negotiate over very difficult things. He, They'd shut the government down, he'd veto them, they'd come back. You just keep going because we're dealing with a hyper-partisan opposition who has decided their ideology is more important than actually getting results, either for their constituents or for their country. They really have put ideology above everything else. And I don't know all the reasons. I'm going to wait for a smart political scientist to uh, explain it all to me. But it makes the negotiating harder. Uh, you know, back in the 90s, after criticizing, you know, Bill all day, Newt Gingrich would come over to the White House at nine o'clock and they'd, they'd negotiate for a couple of hours. And certainly with, um, you know, the work that I did on the Children's Health Insurance Program or the work I did as a senator, I worked with people who were um, very much political opponents, but we found that common ground. And the same as Secretary of State, I had to round up 
I think, 13 Republicans to pass the New START Treaty. And you just keep working at it. It takes a lot of, uh, a lot of effort, but if you're, if you're persistent, you can get things done. The, the background of that, though, is a real structural rise in, in partisanship and division. Barack Obama is the most polarizing president since we began polling, but before him is George W. Bush, before him, Bill Clinton. Um, both you and Donald Trump begin as the least favorably viewed major party nominees since we began polling. What do you think are the background drivers of the higher polarization, higher bitterness that seems to afflict politicians of both parties now? Well, I think there are a number of factors. Um, again, I'm not sure I, I totally understand it all. Um, the media environment, particularly the social media environment, drives negativity. It's what captures eyeballs. It's what you know gets people uh, to tune in or log on. It, it, it is just human nature. Uh, saying something negative about somebody, whether it was a negative ad 30 years ago or a negative tweet or other uh, allegations today, there is just a, a really rich environment for that to capture people's minds uh, and uh, change their attitudes. And there's a lot of behavioral uh, science that if you attack somebody endlessly, even if none of what you say is true, the very fact of attacking that person uh, raises doubts and creates, creates a negative uh, perspective. As someone exhibit A on that, since it has been uh, a, a long time that uh, I've been in that uh, uh, position, I get that. I get it. And it's, it's always amusing uh, to me that when I have a job, I have really high approval ratings when I'm actually doing the work. Uh, I get reelected with 67% of the vote running for reelection in the Senate. When I'm Secretary of State, I have 66% approval rating. And then I seek a job. I run for a job and, you know, all of the discredited negativity, negativity comes out again and, you know, all these arguments and, and attacks uh, start up. So it, it seems to be part of the, uh, the political uh, climate now that is just going to have to be dealt with. Um, but I am really confident that I can break through that and I can continue to build uh, a, uh, a uh, an electoral victory in November. And then once I'm doing the job, I think we'll be back to people viewing me as the person doing the job instead of the person seeking the job. And look, I mean, I, I'm not making any special plea because it's just a reality, but every recent study has shown that if you take all of the media and all of the Republicans and all of the independent expenditures, tens of millions of dollars of negative attacks have been run against me. And that's just uh, something that uh, I've learned to live with, and I don't pay a lot of attention to it Do anymore. Do you feel you get pulled along that slipstream? I think here of the debate when you said that you were proud of having Republicans as your enemies. Do you think that part of this environment has put you in a place of feeding it and running more negative campaigns? Not very much. I mean, you can go back and look at how I've worked with Republicans, and I think I have a very uh, strong uh, base of uh, relationships uh, with them and evidence uh, of that. Um, but, you know, they say terrible things about me, much worse than anything I've ever said about them. That just seems to be part of the, uh, the political back and forth now to appeal to your base, to appeal to the ideologues uh, who support you. We have become so divided and we've got to try to get people, you know, back listening to each other and trying to uh, roll up our sleeves and, and solve these problems that we face. And I, I think we can do that. What, and I know we have, I have to let you go, but I'll ask you this final question. What are three books that have influenced how you think about policy that you think everyone should read? Oh my gosh, there's so many that I've read over the years. I wrote one called It Takes a Village, which I highly you recommend. can't plug your own book. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think um, I think there's uh, a lot of wisdom in uh, Bob Putnam's latest book, Our Kids. I think there's a really great story that he tells about going back to the town he grew up in outside of Cleveland, where kids of all different backgrounds, economic, uh, family uh, standing, you know, they were all together. Everybody was in it together. And... There was so little distinction and there was so much economic uh, integration 
in that small town. And now he goes back to it and it's so divided. It's divided on income. It's divided on race. Uh, it's just a very different environment. And winners and losers are preordained at a very early uh, age. So I, I think that's a book that people should read uh, right now. Um, I think that uh, a lot of um, Christopher Lash's work and Alan Wolf's work and Habits of the Heart, you know, that wonderful old uh, sociological work that was uh, leaded, led by uh, Robert Bella, are also really helpful uh, because we need to be reminded of what, what is unique about the American experience. I mean, de Tocqueville saw it, Habits of the Heart, came from his writings, and you can see how uh, more difficult it is in a 24-7, uh, 360-degree media environment to find the time to think, to breathe, to spend relaxation uh, hours getting to know people. Uh, we just don't do that. So we don't build relationships. We don't, on the Republican-Democratic divide in uh, Washington, spend any time with each other, uh, the, even uh, less than you know what, what I did when I was there, and that wasn't that long ago. Um, so I think looking at, at writings um, by both political scientists and sociologists about how America worked well and trying to sort through, well, where, what did we lose that has made it so hard for people to even listen to each other? And I do think that the, and I keep saying this because I believe it, I think the, the media environment where people are rewarded for being outrageous, for yelling at each other, for saying things that are untrue without being held accountable for it, has contributed to this attitude of divisiveness and separation. And I regret that. I, I think people, you know, maybe it's not the media's role to say, well, wait a minute, that's just not right. I mean, it was shocking when CNN fact-checked some of Donald Trump's saying, sayings the other day. But it's hard for the average viewer or listener to do that himself. And and there there is no guide any longer. It's just not... Um, it's just not easy to sort out what you're being told. And if people are being uh, addressed in their fear as opposed to their openness, their tolerance, their hopefulness, it just creates an even more uh, hardened view about whether we can work with each other or not. And I, I really, I worry about it. I worry that it is it is undermining our democracy. I mean, a democracy relies on the glue of trust. You don't have to agree with me, but I do have to believe, whether it's an economic transaction or my vote, that there's a certain expectation. And yeah, there are people who go off the rails and they're not, you know, everybody's not uh, what they pretend to be. We all know that. But in general, there's got to be that rock solid belief that this transaction between us as voters and citizens rests on something deep and sacred. And I don't know how we get back to that. That's just one follow-up on that, and then I swear I'll let you go. The invocation of trust, sir, I think is really interesting. And, and you bring up the media. We are one of many institutions that the public, if you look at polling, has lost trust in tremendously over the last 50 years. They've lost trust in their politicians, they've lost trust in business, and lost trust in the media. So when you say that there are gatekeepers who should you know, fact check and at Vox we do a lot of fact checking. But one issue is that people don't listen anymore. Why do you think there's been such a systemic loss of trust across so many different institutions all at once? How do you explain that change in America? Well, because I, I really believe that none of us have done what we should have done in being really straightforward about what we know and what we don't know and being willing to say, you know, we reported that story last week, it turns out we were wrong. Or we didn't tell you everything that you might have needed to make a decision. I've argued with network executives for 25 years that somebody is going to really figure out that running a news program where you actually say, hey, we got that wrong, or you know, I'm not so sure what he just said was right, in fact, 
I, I don't think it is, and let me tell you why, and and here's the evidence to that effect, where somebody is trying to like, pull the curtain back, as opposed to everybody go to their corners, whether it's ratings or whether it's an ideological position, that's really what we're about, as opposed to, hey, we've got a really solemn responsibility and we're going to level with you. You may not like what we hear, uh, what you hear, but we're going to try to the best of our ability not to get it wrong. And when we do, we're going to be the first to tell you. And and I think that, you know, politicians, I mean, look at the nonsense that people say running for office. I mean, just ridiculous stuff. And they get away with it because, you know, there's no big, you know, gong that, that rings like, oh, my gosh, look at what so and so just said. Um, but there should be some uh, reward for trying to get it right. Uh, and for trying to correct it when you get it wrong. And until we decide, and maybe it's too threatening, and maybe whether you're in politics, business, uh, media, or wherever you are, it's just too threatening to admit that. Um, I don't know how we're going to rebuild the trust because it really starts with saying, hey, I made a mistake, or I didn't get it right, or hey, I've got more information, let me tell you, and just doing it in a very you know, matter-of-fact way. Secretary Clinton, thank you so much. Good to talk to you. Thank you so much.